Let me say this to you. Uh, many of you have been around for the uh, past 30 years, and, and some of you are just coming on board. Um, and I want to say this in a way that, uh, especially more meaningful to those who've been here for at least 14, 15 years, Satan would have greatly rewarded me if I'd stopped preaching about Atla years ago. I would probably be, um, you know, I, you know, somebody probably would have pushed me up to running for uh, congressman or senator from, from Harlem, from this district. 30 years ago, 30 years ago, before Atla, before my commitment to Atla, I probably could have been talked into running for office, for public office, to run against Charles Rangel and um, or, or some other congressperson or in some other political office in the New York State or New York City. I probably, 30 years ago, if I had not received the vision, Satan would have greatly rewarded me with one of those positions. But the granddaddy of all things is that I probably would be a very wealthy, very powerful man uh, uh, with, with, a, with a broadcast network that, that would rival anything that you've seen anywhere if I had, in that past 30 years, not preached against Obama, against Trump, and the truth about black people, where uh, things would have gone, and I probably would have been Satan's boy at that time. I'm coming back to that to give more definition about that. But it's been 30 years since God gave the word and the vision, Atla, the land where the people shall walk barefoot because the land is holy ground. During that year in 1991, four tremendous women, they are now, they were babies, were born in that year. We've called them the Vestal Virgins. They made some speeches this past Sabbath at the 10 a.m. worship service. We pray that you were able to catch that. If not, we're going to be introducing them at some point later on within the next couple of days to give some segments of those speeches that they gave uh, at the Outlaw Celebration. Uh, these four women have gone on to uh, do tremendous things, uh, to medical school, to PhDs, to law school, uh, and to uh, the, uh, and to the, the great, uh, if you will, musical realm of opera. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it, it's just been an incredible journey for them. Outlaw was born, by the way, in the event I you would want to be able to have a further dose of it, was born in a prayer meeting in my home. And I, I've, during this outlaw celebration, at least over the next couple of days, uh, both in the Trust in the Lord and the Manning Report, you're, you're going to be hearing about the historical uh, advent of outlaw and all of the ancillary events around it as the Lord will give me the utterance to be able to talk about it or to explain it, because I think it's very exciting what's going on. And if I look back over my life and the life of this ministry over the past 30 years, it's been an extraordinary time. But Atla was born in a prayer meeting. I was in my home uh, at my favorite prayer place uh, at 6 o'clock in the morning on the 14th of September. And while praying, God spoke the word, the Holy Ghost spoke the word, lot to me. God spoke the word and the Holy Ghost said, see now the word you've just spoken is a new name I've given for the community formerly known as Harlem. And, uh, and that was that. So I, I want to be able to we'll celebrate within the 30th celebration. We're, we're not able to bring in all our members, the ones that we have. I'm not trying to indicate that we've got thousands of members all over everywhere, but we do have some very faithful members in Australia uh, and in uh, China and uh, and in England uh, and and in various parts of America, and we have some in Africa and uh, and the Caribbean as well. Um, and we would have loved to have brought them to the church this um, uh, this celebration, but as you know, the COVID nineteen makes it difficult for people to travel. Also, makes it difficult for large numbers of people to assemble in one place. And so several months ago, we canceled the, you know, the meeting of calling all of our members, those who were able to come to the meeting here for the 30th of September. But we're going to try to give you as much 
of, of a Diala celebration online as possible. And of course, we have a large number of people who are just regular listeners. They like the ministry that we do. They listen to the teachings that we do. They're just regular. They're not members. Not yet. We are praying that they will become full-fledged, supported, and blessed members of this event. The more they listen, there's so many challenges and things that they have to, hurdles that they have to uh, to, to do to be able to walk in as a member of the Outlaw World Missionary Church. And we understand that, uh, but we're praying that those hurdles will be met and that people will find peace and joy and strength and blessings as saying that I am a member of the Outlaw World Missionary Church and the good honorable Dr. James David Manning is my pastor and my teacher and he is unto Jesus the Lord's servant. We pray that at some day uh, and soon rather than later, that would will, that will be the confession of many. But we want to try to make this online presentation as best we possibly can. Not everybody listens to the um, pulpit of power or the open rewards. A lot of people just listen to the trust in the Lord, and a lot of people just listen to the man report. So we're going to try to cover all bases uh, here uh, in the, the sessions, both in the trust in the Lord sessions and the man report sessions. But yes, Outlaw was born in a prayer meeting. I was on my knees praying. Now, I want to say this to you, and I want to be quite, uh, you know, upfront with you about this. I, I have to tell you, and I made a statement about this uh, in, a, in a partial way on this past Sabbath at the Outlaw World Missionary Church. But I was praying at this old Chippendale chair. I bought this chair when I was in seminary. I had just started furnishing in my apartment, um, and I went by a used furniture place, um, on Park Avenue, I think it was, or Lexington Avenue or someplace there about. And, and I went into this antique store, and there was this old Chippendale chair, and I fell in love with it. And uh, I, I purchased it, and I was still a student in school, wearing jeans and, you know, plaid shirts, and, you know, <laughs> I was a student to be a student. Um, I wasn't dressed in a suit and tie in those years, but I bought this Chippendale chair. It's a beautiful chair, and uh, this chair is over 33 years old. Yeah, it's at least that old, at least that, that I've owned it. It probably was, was owned by someone 100 years ago. It looks like I didn't get the, bio, biology of the biography of the chair, but it probably could be as much as 100 years old. I know I've had it for 33 years. At any rate, so I have to tell you that I, uh, I made this statement on this past Sabbath at worship that if I had not met Jesus in 1976, um, I would not believe Atla after 30 years that hasn't come to pass and Elder Smith in the event you're listening or Evangelist Brown in the event you're listening, you know, or Evangelist Carter in the event you're listening. I, you know, I, I have to tell you, and I can't be able to sure of this, but I, I believe if I had not, Ellis Smith, if I had not met Jesus in 1976, I, I, you know, I don't think I could carry this belief about outlaw as strong as I've been carrying it over the past 30 years. You know, if I had not met Jesus, even though uh, Esther Bennett has been in the ministry since Heck was a puppy, and now Heck has uh, got puppies of his own. Um, but Esther Bennett, you know, I don't believe that, um, you know, 30 years to believe God and not see the vision come to pass is a, is a, large, is a large segment of a man's life. And to keep everybody else excited about Allah for 30 years without seeing the vision come to pass. In fact, what we've seen is a lot of setbacks. You know, Bob Jackson, if you're listening, we've seen a lot of setbacks over the past 30 years. I, I would not say that we've seen more setbacks than we've seen steps forward towards the full, if you will, fruition of Allah, but we've seen enough to discourage anybody. But I, the reason why 
and, and this is new revelation for a lot of people to give you something to hang your hat on. The, the reason why I'm as excited about Outlaw as I was at 6 o'clock in the morning on September the 14th, 1991, I am even more excited now. Uh, it, it's because I, I met Jesus, and I knew he would not lie to me. I met him in 1976. I met him 76 or 4 to 80. I met him 15 years earlier. And I know he would not lie to me. So that has been the strength. If you wonder, why does Pastor Manning keep preaching about Outlaw and all the awful things that are happening? Look at what's happening to Harlem now. The locusts have come up here. And yet, he's still faithful. I'm faithful. It's because I've met Jesus. And I, I want to be able to explain that as new information for people to kind of sink their teeth in or hang their hats on, if you will. Um, it, it, that gives me the strength. Um, and I have to tell you as well, when I met Jesus in 1976, I was sick with sin and grief. I was, I was sin sick. I don't know if that's a... Uh, a, a new phrase for our vocabulary for, but I was sin sick in, in that jail cell in 1976. I, I was. And I would, I would say also to anyone who's trying to understand that I have faithfully, faithfully nurtured and spoke the word outlaw and cared for this this vision that God has given to me as a precious, precious, uh, if you will, virgin birth child is because I met Jesus. And the reason why I met him is because I was sin sick back in 1976. I was, I, I was sicker than every known disease to man. A, a man, I was sick and it was sin that had made me sick. And I, I, I do have the, you know, the unction and I think the place to talk to Jesus about why he allowed me uh, to be such a renegade. Now, I never murdered anybody, but probably yet, so probably people probably wish I had done so. Um, but to be such a renegade as I was. And the reason why I consider myself such a renegade, because I didn't have to do it. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, there was no need for all that craziness. I, there was no need for it. Sometimes, it, you know, if a man is hungry, you know, he might steal something to feed his family. I didn't have to steal. I just did it as if it was something pleasurable to do. The more I did it, the more I got the pleasure of stealing. I did. No, I did. I prided myself on how much I stole. Now, I'm going to say in a moment that I was, I was sin sick so after I realized what I did. And that, that's just small, some small things. I, asked, I did some other things I'm going to talk to you about a little bit later on. But I was sick, and I'd done such evil things and full of grief. I was grieving like a dead man did, you know. You see, you, when people die, they still grieve. People who are, who are alive grieve for the dead, but the dead grieve even worse than those who are grieving. Once they're dead, you're in that dead spot. You're in that dead spot. You're going to grieve something grieving unless you know Jesus, unless you got it locked down and got it going on. But I, I tell you this, I, uh, I really wasn't looking for anything. I, what I wanted to do, I was so sin sick, I wanted to, I wanted to beg the... For, for, for forgiveness. I wanted the Lord to, and, and not in forgiveness in a traditional sense so I can say I'm forgiven. That wasn't, I wanted, I wanted the whole thing moved. I wanted the Lord to undo. I wanted the Lord to undo all the stuff I had done. Now I'm trying to build and tell you why I still believe Atla, and you're going to see this is relevant and very important. Uh, and for me, this is new information and it's certainly a new dispensation of more information about why after 30 years I'm still here. And it perchance, as anyone who has an open mind, it might help you to understand me a little bit better um, and why I am so tenaciously driven uh, and steadfast, immovable on the word outline, the plan of God and will not back down 
and, and can't be turned around. But I, you know, I was begging for the Lord to relieve me. You can call it forgiveness if you want. And I did, I did ask for that. Um, I, I just wanted to, um, to, 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 for the Lord to, uh, to, to, to take away the burden. And a, a large part of the burden I was, was feeling was a burden, you know, of the abandonment of my family. And at, at that time I had two families. You know, I did. I had, a, I had a wife and a family. I had a girlfriend and a family. They both had children. And um, I uh, and I abandoned both of them. And in my mind, I didn't, didn't think about it as abandonment, but it was stomped down. It, it was brutal. It was it was cruel. It was it sent them into many many sleepless nights. I'm sure. And when I finally realized that's what I had done, I begged for forgiveness. I, I begged somehow or another that you know that I could be released from that. And the method by which over the years of the things I had done could be remedied would be the Lord forgive me. And it, it, to some degree it works uh, and it removes some penalties, but it does not remove the stain of the events themselves. And so I went from there. Now I'm trying to explain to you why I am who I am. I'm trying, and I'm trying to explain to you why I believe Atla and why God, his name is Jesus, spoke Atla to me. And I'm praying that you'll take the time to, uh, to, to, to listen to the summation at this 30th year of Atla celebration. So the injury that I did to my family and my children um, was perhaps paramount in terms of things that I just realized it was just, just so wrong. Um, and it didn't catch up to me until I was sitting in a jail cell. And I wanted to be forgiven of it because it was just, it, it, was, it was very painful what I did. And, uh, you know, a pain that, and a stain that, that, that lasts forever. I wanted some relief. Um, and of course there were other things I did and I certainly, you know, robbing people's homes. Now I never went into a home and, you know, I would always wait for people to leave or be gone someplace. Uh, and I, and I looking for jewelry, stuff I could put in my pocket or put in a small bag. I wouldn't look at taking nobody's television set. I who wants that? Um, but yeah, but I, you know what? I would go through people's homes looking for jewelry and I had, you know, I'd heard that people, you know, what they had a, you know, a large diamond. Oftentimes women would stick their diamonds. I don't know if y'all remember Pond's cold cream or any kind of cold cream that you could have a jar of it. Well, they knew the burglars were coming such as myself. So they'd put their jewels in, in cold cream jars or someplace where you would never think to look for when they wanted, they would just take it out. And, and cleaned it off, polish it up, and, uh, and the cold cream would help polish it and put it on their fingers and, and other things. like So you had to go through, you had to rip people's houses, rip open mattresses, turn over toilet seats. You had to do all that because people would hide stuff, and they rightly should have. So when I came in, I left no mattress or sheet or shoe or curtain or cold cream jar unturned. So when people got home, the house was a mess, and I'm sure they never felt like living there again. I, I, I regret I did that. God knows I do. I, I regret that I did that to people's homes. And they come in, they come home, and look at their house. What happened? You know what? What happened? I, I regret I did it. I mean, I I'm, I was sin sick that, and I you know I wanted the Lord to to relieve me. Um, you know, and I tell you this as well. I prayed that Jesus would bless and restore every. I did the, the, the Zacchaeus prayer, prayer. You know, you know Zacchaeus, little short guy in the Bible, up in the sycamore tree, took Jesus home for a great meal. Took Jesus and the boys home for a lunch on his seaside uh, house. Then said he's gonna give back what he stole from people. Well, I, you know, I, I asked. The Lord, if he would now, I'm trying to explain to you who, why 
I believe God gave me the word ought. I'm trying to explain it to you. I'm trying to explain to you why for 30 years I'm more excited today than I was on the 14th of September, 1991, at the giving of the word Atla. And one of the reasons for that, let me quickly state, is that I believe Atla is going to stop people from doing, especially men, from doing what I did. When Atla comes, there won't be men abandoning their family and their children the way I did and bringing the grief and the pain and the hurt and the uncertainty and the hate that I did. When Atla comes, that's going to end. So you can see, beyond the fact that I'm asking the Lord to forgive me, I want to now make sure that nobody else, no other woman, no other child suffers the way uh, I made women and children suffer. And nobody else robs the way I robbed as well, and that's important. That people don't come home and find their lives and you just don't feel like going to sleep in that bedroom anymore. You know somebody's been in there that ripped open the mattress. You don't want to sleep in that house anymore. You don't want to sleep there no more. I know that. And, and people never felt, I'm sure they never felt safe in their homes ever, ever. Even if probably moved to someplace else if they could afford to do it. Probably never felt safe in their homes again. Because they've been so violated. I violated people's homes, their peace. I did. And I was sin sick. I was sicker than sick in that jail cell of the things I've done. At the top of the list, of course, was my abandonment of my children at that time. And so I want to be able to say this. Listen, I, 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 one of the reasons, Elder Smith, Elder Butler, one of the reasons why uh, I am so zealous about Atla, and I hope you can understand. One of the reasons why I'm so zealous about Atla and so zealous about false preachers and prophets and hustlers and racism, one of the reasons I'm so zealous about that is because Atla says all of that stuff that I did will not be done to any other women or children. And, and, and I wanted to be forgiven, and though I've been released, the stain is still there. So I, it, it's like I'm still on my knees in that jail cell, Elder Butler, from, uh, from 1970. It's like I'm still on my knees right now every time I stand in the pulpit or every time I go to the prayer closet. It's like I'm still on my knees trying to get forgiven for the, for the injury, the hurt, the pain that I did. Especially to the women that were in my life and the children that were in my life, uh, you know. And so the way I'm trying to remedy it now is to stop everybody else from doing what I did. You see what I'm saying? So I ain't going to never change. You ain't going to never get me to walk away from this. You ain't going to never get me to walk away from this. You, you ain't going to. You, you can talk with you. You can talk all that, you know, prosperity talk. You can talk all that Black Lives Matter talk. You can talk all that civil rights talk. You can talk all that all you want. You ain't going to never get me to walk away from trying to stop people from doing what I did. I can tell you that right now. It, it's a lost cause. I ain't going to never stop. So my belief in art law is deeper than deep. No, mm -mm, brother, no, sir, no. When you see what I did, you know, I never killed anybody, never raped anybody, never done anything like that. You know, that's bad enough. But I can tell you this, uh, the injury that I did, and I'm going to get into more detail of about it and, uh, going forward. But I want you to know, say, well, you know, I, I just think Pastor Man is wrong about this. And I just don't, you know, you know but, but brother, let me tell you something. Hold your horses. You don't know what I'm dealing with. Well, why are you so hard on the black man? You, you, you always beating down on the black man. Why you, why you ain't for the black people? Brother, listen to me. I'm trying to stop him. I'm trying to talk to him. You know what he does. Baby's daddy, mama's baby. You know what he does. He did, he's doing the same thing I did. By a fact of millions, and I'm trying to stop it. I try to beat down on nobody. So everybody need to get wise to. Well, now we try to understand why Pastor Manning. Well, you know, ain't no point in trying to talk to him about 
All that other stuff them talking about down there, and then, and then, that Obama stuff, you forget that. He ain't going down that road. The man is still in pain for what he did. No, nah, he ain't going down that road. You can forget that. So I, I want to say, to, I, you know, I pray somehow that that helps you, you know, I'm still trying to get forgiven. You know, and wrecking people's homes and humiliating people. The um, I told you about how I told my grandmother to mind her own business. What kind of nonsense is that? Who am I? Tell her my grandmother after she slept in a chair so I could sleep on the sofa in that little old studio apartment she had over there on St. James Place. And then when I got big enough to smell myself, and she told me that I need to stop running the streets and go home with my wife and children. I told her she ought to mind her own business. What kind of fool was I then? What kind of, is there some sort of category that is there a classification of fools like fool number one, a fool number zenith, a fool number, you know, a fool on a hill? I mean, what kind of fool would talk to his grandmother like that? I did. No, I did. I did. I'm still trying to get forgiven. That's why I'm preaching so hard. And I, I see people doing that all the time. You know, let me say this parenthetically. Maybe there's somebody out there listening. You know, when you see a young man going crazy and doing stuff that's crazy, don't support him. Don't help him. And, uh, you know, let's say you see a young man in his 20s like I was. Maybe he's talking back to a preacher. He's talking back to his boss. Or, and, you, you know, don't help him. Don't, don't help him because he's crazy. And you're a senior, you're an adult, you're a grandmother, or you're, you know, you're an older person. Don't, don't, don't help that boy fight. Don't help him. Don't give him a place to sleep. Say, hell no. You ain't going to fight no preacher in my house. You ain't, you ain't going to fight. You ain't going to live in my house while you're fighting the preacher. Hell no. You ain't, you ain't living in my house and fighting the preacher or fighting the boss man or fighting your wife or fighting. You ain't gonna fight, you, I ain't going to help you fight nobody. I don't care if you're right or wrong. You ain't, there ain't no right or wrong. The right of this is I ain't going to help you fight. Your wife, I ain't going to help you fight no preacher. I ain't going to help you fight no boss man. I ain't going to help you fight. You fight the preacher, you can't stay in my house. Get the hell out of here. I ain't stand you old preacher fighter. You young boy, you ain't got no, what you know what you're doing. You ain't, you ain't staying in my house. Get out of here. So, I mean, I, you know, pray this would enlighten people to understand something. No, I ain't going to ever stop preaching about outlaw. Not to, when Jesus comes, I'll give it over to him. Or Elijah comes, I might let him have it say, well, if he'll take it over for me for a while. But I know something. No, man, you think I'm, you, I'm more zealous about outlaw now than I've ever been. And you need to know that. I was begging for forgiveness. You know, the other thing is that I've asked the Lord to restore the people. And I, it's, you know, it's kind of hard to, you know, all the stuff I stole from people. And not just physical things, but spiritual things. Life and time and joy and peace. I stole it. I stole like a thief in broad daylight from people. Not just jewelry and stuff, but I stole their patience. I stole their trust. I stole, I stole, and I stole, and I stole, and I, everything I did was either a lie or stealing. And I asked the Lord to restore people. You know, I asked the Lord to bless people. If he could, you know, just bless them, Lord. Just, you know, I, you know, they ain't going to never get those years back. They ain't going to never get those times back. They don't give them those sleepless nights. They ain't going to get them back. But I was asking the Lord, if you, you know, if you could restore Everything I took from the people. And, uh, but most, you know, you just can't be replaced. So what I'm doing now, what you see me doing the last 30 years, is trying to stop anybody else from doing what I did. That's who I am. You're going to, I, you, you come, don't you come in here. Don't you could get in my face with all that nonsense that I was, here you going to come think you're going to talk to me. <laughs> you, you talk to me about who bomber, about black men, about black life. Who the hell are you, you, you going to talk to me? 
who done got down on my knees and begged the Lord to take me away from that foolishness that you're talking. <laughs> you done lost your mind or something else. Your mind and your behind. Now, I could use another word, but it would sound cussing if I did. But it's in the Bible. No. So let me just say this. You know, we're doing this throughout the Trusting Lord today and the Manning Report. Well, this is a long series. It'll run one right into the other. But I want to say, um, men, that you're listening. First of all, let me say to people, don't give shelter to your sons when they're doing wrong. Don't give shelter. Don't give a morsel of bread or red penny to your sons and your daughters when they're doing wrong. Now, listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. Don't be giving to this flesh and blood. That's my child. Don't be giving me that. When they are wrecking their lives, they are literally destroyed. And I was, I destroyed people's lives. I did. No, I did it. Now, I confess I did it. I know I did it. I know I did it. And my grandmama wouldn't give me any, she wouldn't give me any refuge. No, she, she, you, no I ain't going to help you. I ain't going to help you destroy your wife and your children. I ain't going to help you. Let me say something to everybody out there. Let me say something. I'm going to talk to you now. I want to talk to you. Don't help people even if you think they're right. Don't help people. Don't help your daughter fight her husband and don't help your son fight his wife. Don't help them. If they fight, let them fight on their own. They get out of my house. You ain't fighting in here. Get out of here. You ain't fighting up in here. Get out of here. That's your daughter. You can put your daughter out. Yeah, she married him. She should have thought about that before she married him. Get out of my house. I ain't going to help you fight that boy. Well, mama, he did this and he died. Well, I don't want to hear it. Get out of my house. Get out of my house. So that, that, and that would know because you don't want to help. You know, and I, you know, let's, and whatever you do. You, you, and people need to understand this. You know, we got getting rid of the ordainers and elder in the church, and we've got elders here and leaders in the church. You need to know never help anybody fight a preacher. Where are the preachers wrong? How do you know? You know, it, this, you may not call this Bible, right? You may say, well, where you'll find that in the Bible? Well, I can show it to you in the Bible, but I'm going to, first I'm going to lay it on you, then I'm going to show it to you in the Bible. You ain't got no right. Let's say you say that um, you're going to help a church member fight a preacher, right? Especially a young person, but it doesn't matter what now. The age doesn't really matter at this point. I'm coming back to the young people and the young men. The um, where the preacher is wrong, and and I I'm just gonna take sides with my son, and I'm gonna take sides with it really, yeah, cause he's wrong. The Bible says he's wrong, and so I'm gonna help my son fight the preacher. I'm gonna help him fight the preacher. I'm gonna help him fight God's servant. I'm a, I'm gonna help him cause the preacher's wrong. Really, really. Can I share something with y'all? I'm going to take y'all deep down the Bible now because y'all ain't be, y'all been, y'all been hanging around these Sunday school meetings. You know, the only time you can ever say that the preacher is wrong is when it's something that you ain't never done. <laughs> you know, years ago I was dating this young woman, right? <clears throat> And uh, so uh, we were driving somewhere. I think we were going to a restaurant. I don't know, right? Um, so uh, some guy cut me off. And I almost hit the guy. And he, he cut me off. And so, you know, I got I was saying all kinds of things to the guy. He couldn't hear me. So she was sitting in the car. She said, what are you talking about? I said, you see what it is? She said, you act like you ain't never done that to people before. Then I thought for about, you know, I've cut so many people off when I'm driving cars. I've done so many things driving cars, not even concerned about the people that are behind me. You know, I got a thing now, too, by the way. If I see a taxi 
ride a guy driving a taxi or a bus driver. You know, usually when I'm driving down the street, I don't let nobody get in front of me. Somebody trying to pull out from a Sacoma parking space or trying to get into a, you know, I don't know, I'm going to ease right up. I ain't going to let you get in front of me. <laughs> That's got to drive. I know you ain't getting in front of me. The only people I let get in front of me is a taxi cab and a bus. I let the bus go. Because I figure the guy's working. The guy on the taxi cab, I let him go. I let him get in there because I figure he's working, right? So I'm just out there driving, probably going to a restaurant or something like that. I ain't got no schedule. But this guy, he's working. So I let him. But anybody else, don't you try to get in front of me. <laughs> so anyway, let me say something to you. Let me say something to you. you don't, don't help your son fight his, his wife. And don't help anybody fight the preacher. Because the only reason you get even a partial hearing there is that if it's something that you or yourself ain't never done. Now, if you've done the same thing, you know, well, let, me put it here. let me put it down here where y'all can get it because now y'all getting all getting ready to disconnect. You know what? I'm going to tell you something. There was an event in the Bible in John's Gospel, chapter 8. Well, there was a woman caught in the very act of a They caught her right in the bed with the man. They were in the bed together. Seemed pretty gross to me, somebody, a group of people pulling a woman out from underneath a man in the bed. But that's what they did, the Bible says, in John chapter 8. And they, that, well, what's worse, they dragged her to Jesus. Said, we caught her in the very act. We caught her in the very act, they said. We caught her. We caught her, Jesus. We got her. Now, you know what the law says. The law says stone her. That's what the law said. Jesus said, yeah, that's right. Then the Bible said he stooped down on the ground and was writing something. I probably was probably writing the names of some of the women, <laughs> other women. And so Jesus said, yeah, you can fight her, but only if you ain't never done this yourself. Only if you ain't got no sin in your life. If you ain't got no sin in your life, then you can accuse her. You can fight her. We try to fight no preacher if you've done the same thing or something worse. That's one thing. And then you're going to help somebody. No, my grandma, Mama Neal, told me that, uh, you know, uh-uh, boy, you ain't getting no help over here. Don't even come over here. Don't even come, you ain't, don't even come over here if you're hungry doing what you're doing. No, mm -mm. I was teaching the other day about, you know, I got an uncle who's a deacon in the Baptist church. And, you know, he's an uncle. He's good. Everything's good to go, you know. And uh, I was teaching the other day about how, uh, he thought he could sit me down and call a family meeting real home. <laughs> we got Bennett, Esther Bennett, y'all know her, in her house. She got four women, five women all told, and they have to have family meetings to get through the day. <laughs> yeah, Lord have mercy, a family meeting. These family meetings never turn out good. They're worse than family reunions. Anyway, this guy called a family meeting on me. Who the hell do you think he is? I mean, I, up until that time, I would never disagree. I mean, he's uncle, but you, you ain't nobody. I'm a pastor, man. You, wait a minute. You need to respect the fact I'm, I'm a pastor 30 years. You call no family meeting on me. <laughs> you, you done lost your mind. You're going to call it. You, and you are, you're just a deacon anyway. <laughs> I'm not sure you're such a good one. I'm a, I'm a faithful pastor of a million meals and a thousand people baptized. And you're going to call a family meeting on me? I know you done lost your mind. Somebody should have told him. <laughs> you know, Tyler Perry, in one of his, in his movies, was working in a department store. <laughs> <laughs> and the woman comes in. She's a Jaffer woman, you know, and she's asking for the lingerie, the lingerie section. <laughs> and, and Tyler Pierce, you, you, you don't need to go to the lingerie section. You, you only go there when they got them big underwear. <laughs> You still old as you are, still talking about lingerie. Somebody should have told you years ago that ain't for you. That's for young people. <laughs> Somebody should have told him, you don't call a meeting on a pastor. What are the deacons? Yeah, the Baptist deacon love to do that. Though. They tell, well, call the pastor into a meeting. You ain't calling me into nothing. You lost your mind. Sometimes what on the earth is people thinking? So listen. If you ain't never done anything like that, you ain't got no business 
fighting somebody who has done it. And it's your job. You see the wisdom behind that? So it's important that we understand my zeal, my, my zeal for Allah. I ain't, man, listen, let me tell you something. I'm trying to stop men from doing what I did. Now, this segment has to go over into uh, the, uh, the, the next segment where I can, uh, in the demanding report, to, 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 we're going to get Outlaw 30-year report in the Manning report. Uh, I'm going to have to take a break right now and, and get ready for the next hour, and I'm going to come back and do a refresher, and I'm going to, uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 further explain my zeal. And, and I pray this, this will help you to understand why I'm no ways tired of talking about Outlaw. Uh, Minister Williams? Christian, I ain't no Williams. I'm not talking. There ain't no way I'm going. Lord have mercy. When you see the stuff I did when I was out there in the street, I'm still trying to get cleaned up from all that mess. No, brother. I ain't going with Obama. Mm -mm, no, sir. You got to be out your mind. No, mm -mm, none of that civil rights talk either. I'm still trying to get straight. So I hope that this gives you a bit of uh, an insight in the Pastor Manning. And uh, don't expect, I'm, listen, there are a lot of people out there that probably done a whole lot worse by their wives and their children. They just aren't man enough to realize it. Uh, they're too much of a devil to confess it. No, mm -mm. no, so, no. So um, I'm, mm -mm. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm no ways tired. Uh, Lord have mercy. I can't wait to preach Sometimes I, I'm I'm itching to preach, and ain't, I ain't gonna get a chance to preach for another five hours because I'm I, I'm trying to get rid of this pain. I'm trying to get rid of all that ugly stuff. I'm trying. The Lord don't forgive me. Now Jesus came in there to sell, and you know what happened? But I, I'm I, mm, and now He got me on assignment to tell other men not to do what I've done. Well, you know I'm gonna do it. That's a part of my restoration. And Lord have mercy, I don't want to see nobody do to their wives and children and to other people's homes and jewelry and lives. I mean, I did a whole lot of stuff. Even when I wasn't robbing and lying, I was, you know, did a whole lot of after-hour stuff late at night in the dark. <laughs> so, no, uh, all I was here to stay. And I'm chasing these people. I, you know, I'm going to fight. If I have to fight these liberal, democratic, Black Lives Matter, Obama, Trump sycophants, if I had to fight, fight them right by myself, I would do it with my left hand tied behind my back. No, mm -mm. no, sir, I ain't quitting this. You don't know your damn mind. That's another thing about you. You're always cussing. What's in the Bible? Jesus said that people don't believe a damn you don't believe so, you damned. <laughs> well, that, that you're using it in the wrong context. Oh, now you become an English professor. Oh, I see. <laughs> you, you're not an English professor. Now you are narrating English and telling people what's right and what's wrong. Oh, I see. Oh, I see who you are. I done figured all that out about you already. Uh, but in the past 30 years, you know, we had uh, Evangelist Brown gave a stellar report, and, and Bennett did as well uh, this past Sabbath at the afternoon versus or after that great big meal we had out there in the courtyard. Uh, and uh, they gave a, pretty much a, a, a historical account of all the things that have happened. My God, from Zion. Um, that since, um, you know, since a vision has been spoken and since... Sabbath worship and all of that kind of a thing. You know, I've written three books. Is that right? Well, actually, uh, two books and a pamphlet. But one of our books, both our books are out of print. You know, they're selling my book, uh, Oblation Hour. They're selling that book online now for eight hundred and seventy-seven dollars. It's what they're asking for. It's out of print. Somebody sent me a note the other day and said, uh, the, uh, do you have any more of the books of uh, Oblation Hour? I thought it was a bit suspicious. Why are you asking me about the Oblation Hour? Lord have mercy. Elizabeth went online. And then on Amazon, they have jacked the price of that book up to $877. Uh, 
When I first wrote it, I couldn't get my people to pay $7 for it. Now, because it's out of print, it's rare, and it is a gem of a book. It's a mamma jamma of a book, no doubt about it. $877, and people are paying the price for it. Anyway, uh, that's one of the things that have happened over the past 30 years. But uh, I think the engineers probably got the, the, the information there about it. Yeah. Hardcover is now $877.95. What's the 99 cents for? 95 cents. What's that for? Got three used copies for $644. A book I wrote. Imagine that. A book I wrote years ago is now worth being sold for nearly $900. A book I wrote. And I did most of it in my sleep. Anyway, I want to ask you to come up close for just one second. And I, I want to talk to three year and older veterans of the uh, Trust and Lord Hour, uh, the Open Rewards Prayer Meeting, the Manning Report, and the Pulpit of Power, those four ministries that we do every week, uh, producing at least 20 different ministries or sermons every week. If you are a three-year or older veteran, by old I mean four years, five years, six years, seven years, 10 years, 12 years uh, old veteran of, of any of these ministries that we do on a daily basis every week, and you are not a supporter, you've not joined with the, uh, the ministry to give your, uh, to pledge your support and your alignment with what we've been teaching. I, and I, my question is why? Yeah, you've had three years to observe us. You've had three years to listen to us on a daily basis, all weekend, all day long, any hour of the day. We're broadcasting. Uh, you've had three years to watch our various successes. You've three years to watch our ups and downs. You've had three years to listen to the tenor or the consistency of what we have said, whether we are consistent or whether we're all over the chart and what we do and what we believe. You've had three years to watch people around us who have made the commitment to join with our ministry and church and to financially support it. And by the way, I want to give another shout out to Brother Jesse Munez out there in San Bernardino, along with uh, uh, Goldfinger, who is just an extraordinary giver, and others that do extraordinary uh, giving to our ministry. My question is to you, if you are a three-year veteran or older, why haven't you joined? Why haven't you committed? And I suppose some of the reasons we say, well, Pastor Man, I belong to another church. And uh, why? How could you, how could you, after three years of hearing me teach about the Sabbath, about righteousness, about the tribulation, and listen to me faithfully as you do, and still go sit up in another pastor's face? How could you be? It's like you, it's like a woman sleeping with two men. You know, one she likes during the week and the other she likes on the weekend. It is it's hypocritical. Um, how could you do that? I mean, as I say, you started three months ago. I can understand why it may take you some time to evaluate. It may take you some time to look at me, to discover you know, who I am. You say, well, pastor, that's not that I don't belong to another church or ministry. I, I, you, I'm with you. But there's some things you say I like, and there's some things you say I don't like. Why? Why is it that some, you, you've made a decision that there's some things that, I, that you don't like are stronger than the things that you do like. I, you know, I am not a psychiatrist, but I am an analyst. And I have to tell you, I analyze the world and I, I understanding. But the understanding and wisdom tells me this, that if there are things that a person such as myself that I am saying, there, there is no room to disagree with what I am saying, unless your purpose is to find something to disagree with. Let's say, for instance, you say, well, I like the fact that you talk about Obama, but I don't like the fact that you talk about Trump. Let's say, for instance, you're one of those, right? Well, the purpose, it isn't that you, it isn't that you just like what I say about Obama, but don't like what I say about Trump. What it is, is that you are looking for a reason to support Trump. It isn't that you don't like it. It's just that you don't like the fact that I'm saying something about it. It isn't that what I'm saying is wrong. Let me put it that way. It isn't what I'm saying is wrong or indifferent. You know it's right. But you have, you've lived your life or you've come up or you've been raised with a doctrine that you can really live in a false reality. That's where you are. You've been raised in a doctrine that you can live in a false reality. That is to say you can like the truth about Obama 
but you don't like the truth about Trump. And it's the same truth. It's the same truth. There's no difference. But because you have been indoctrinated to live in a false reality, you are really a person who needs psychological debriefing. And, but trust me, there are zillions of people around the world who live that way. I, there, there are people who know what I'm saying about Trump. Obama is right. They know it. But they choose to ignore it based on the fact that they find a reality that isn't true and they've settled in there. Say, so that's one of the reasons why I've not made a commitment because, you know, I, I, I don't like, the fa- I wish you would support what I support. But the, the truth of the matter is, then why do you come? You've given three years or more of your life to listen to me? Three years of your life to listen to me? And you're, no, you're, and you're not tired of listening to me yet? And you've given three years of your life, and over the past three years, your life has been greatly upgraded. You've learned, you've been educated, you've been enlightened. And let me say this to you. If you make the commitment, say, well, Pastor, I'm joining with you and I'm going to support. I'm going to do the tithe and offering. I'm going to do the first fruit. I'm going to keep the Sabbath. Your life is going to soar. Now, listen to me very carefully. Now, I'm not going to leave you alone after this. Listen to me very carefully. You come as often as you come over the past three years because you're being helped. You're being educated. You're being enlightened, right? Right. But the thing that you like, whether you you say, well, I like what you say about Obama, but I don't like what you say about Trump. You do the same thing with the word of God, such as you like the things I say, the teachings that I think, the way I explain the Bible, the way I break it all down and make it clear. But when it comes to things like money or tithing and offering or the Sabbath, well, that you know is also true, but because of your false reality, because you really need a psychological debriefing, because of your false reality, you choose not to believe the tithe or the first fruit or the Sabbath. Now, it isn't that it isn't true. It's just true in all the other things I've said. But you live in a false reality where you, avoid, you try to ignore the truth about the tithe. And so you don't do it. But, it, that is not, but the, everything else I say is good to go. Everything I ever say is good to go. Good enough to share with your friends. It makes you laugh. It educates you. It enlightens you. But the tithe? Well... And the full commitment to the ministry, well, the first fruit offerings, well, the Sabbath. That, that's all true as well. But you have chosen and you've been raised and indoctrinated to have a dual reality, which is dangerous. Jesus said this, and I'll leave you. He said, I would rather you be the hot or cold, but not lukewarm. You're lukewarm. You have a dual reality. He said, if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. I would rather you be completely stomped down against Pastor Manny, trying to, dis- trying to take him down. Be fully against him. Be against him with all of your strength. Or be fully for him with all of your strength. But don't be in the middle somewhere lukewarm. You're, you're better than to be spit out of the mouth of Jesus if you're lukewarm. So what's it going to be? You're going to make the commitment and grow and be even greatly better blessed or you're going to continue to walk in the lukewarm spit of the mouth of the Savior. I'm James David Manning, everybody. I'm the Lord's servant.